But let's go out even further, close to the limit of what we can detect. This is the Hubble Deep Field. So this is peering, peering out into space about as far as we can see. And you see just galaxies beyond imagination. Just incredible. And of course, this surprised some of my evolutionary colleagues that there would be galaxies this far out. They were expecting to see, you see they say you're, you're looking back in time as you look further away, and they were expecting galaxies to be in the process of forming. And instead, of course, you see fully formed, fully designed, beautiful, beautiful galaxies. How awesome is our God? Amen? And I love the way the Bible puts it, because when the Bible describes the creation process of, of the cosmos, it sums it up in the phrase, he made the stars also. Isn't that amazing? God spends all this time on the earth, you know, working on a place for us. And then he's like, you know, you know what would go really well with an earth? A universe. And so he creates the stars. And it was just so easy for him. Most of this was created in, in one day. Incredible. Now, the Bible's not an astronomy textbook, but when it touches upon astronomy, it's right. And so what I want to show you now are some statements that the Bible makes that are sort of astrophysical in nature. They're not intended to be, um, you know, for, for necessarily for PhD scientists. They're just statements that God has made that are true, and we would all agree that they're true today, even though the science of the time didn't necessarily agree with these statements. For example, the Bible talks about the earth being round in Isaiah 40, 22. It says, uh, it talks about the circle of the earth. And there's some other passages in scripture as well, like in Job 26, where it talks about the, li the line between light and darkness being described by a circle. And you know, it's interesting, because if, I, if you look in most astronomy textbooks, they'll credit the Greeks with discovering that the Earth was round, but the Bible actually got it right earlier. And so if you think about it, it must have disagreed with the science of the day. And of course, the Bible's description prevailed. How about that? You know, there's even some beautiful poetic um, statements like God hangs the earth upon nothing, which seems like a, a description of the earth floating there in space. And I grant you, it's a, kind of a poetic statement, and it's, it's made by Job, not God, so we have to be a little bit careful. But it, it does sound like these ancient peoples knew something about astronomy. The universe is expanding. God stretches out the heavens as a curtain and spreads them out as a tent to dwell in. The Bible says many, many times that the universe is being expanded. And it's interesting because it wasn't until the 1920s that the secular science um, kind of caught up with that and realized that indeed the universe is being stretched out. Um, it's the Hubble law. The, universe, the galaxies are all expanding away from each other. Really amazing. You know, this one's a little bit more abstract, but I do believe the Bible teaches a conservation principle, that is the conservation of mass. The amount of stuff that's in the universe is constant because we know that God, all things were made by God, Furthermore, God stopped making things at the end of the creation week. According to uh, Genesis 2.2, God finished his work of creation. So we would not expect anything new to come into existence, you see. And uh, furthermore, we would not expect anything to cease to exist because God upholds all things, and by him all things consist. And we now call that the conservation of mass or the conservation of energy. Einstein tells us mass and energy are the same, really. So uh, it's not really until the 1800s that that was really uh, codified in, in terms of science. But the Bible got it right. This one, again, is a bit abstract. Entropy is a complicated uh, term. It's sort of a measure of messed upness, if you will. And uh, the Bible talks about the universe, heaven and earth, shall wax old like a garment. They're aging. They're running down, wearing out. And I would say that that's a consequence of the second law of thermodynamics unrestrained. And I'll qualify that in a minute. But uh, it's interesting because you, you say, well, it's pretty obvious that things wear out. That's not very profound. And I would say it's obvious on Earth that things wear out and run down. But is it obvious that the universe is running down? If you go out and look at the night sky tonight, or tomorrow night, or whatever, it's going to look about the same. I don't think it's obvious that the universe ages. And of course, the universe was indeed thought to be eternal and unchanging until about the time of Tycho. So, but the Bible got it right from the beginning. See, we now understand from the laws of physics that even if we can't see the slow decay of the universe, it must be decaying. It, the, the amount of usable energy in, in the universe is running out. Now, I do want to make a comment on the second law of thermodynamics because there's been some misunderstanding here. It is not a consequence of the fall of man. No, the second law of thermodynamics must have existed from the beginning of creation because we're designed around that principle, okay? Life requires the second law of thermodynamics to function when you digest food. That's the second law of thermodynamics helping you out. But apparently, originally, uh, the, this, this tendency to decay must have been balanced by God's organizing power so that there was no net decay. 
before sin. And we've seen examples of that in scripture where God's um, presence is a sustaining presence, like in the Israelites in the wilderness, their clothes didn't even wear out. So apparently at the time of the fall, God removed some of that sustaining power, allowing the universe to decay beyond its original design. Now all creation suffers under that bondage of corruption, and one day the universe will be restored. There will still be a second law of thermodynamics, presumably. It's just that God's presence is a restoring presence. Now it's interesting because, of course, today, all scientists would agree that the Earth's spherical and it floats in space and, and that you know, there's a conservation of mass energy and the like, but not that, that hasn't always been believed by secular science, but the Bible got it right, you see. So have we learned the lessons of history? Have we learned that when this, the science of the day disagrees with the Bible, it's not the Bible that needs to be modified? Have we learned that lesson? For the, for the most part, when people try to make God's perfect word and man's fallible opinion agree, guess which one gets modified? And that's very unfortunate. We haven't learned the lessons of history for the most part. And those re you know, we, we try to readjust God's word to fit our opinion. That just destroys the integrity of God's word because um, all, of, all of Christianity depends on a, uh, a, a straightforward reading of the book of Genesis. So we need to base our thinking on God's word and not try to modify God's word to our thinking. So that being said, the Bible says some things that today scientists would not necessarily agree with, or at least most scientists wouldn't. Do we need to adjust God's word? No, we need to adjust our thinking, don't we? For example, the Bible says that God created in six days, and it's clear that the, from the context that those are ordinary, approximately 24-hour days, and it's clear from the genealogies that this was a few thousand years ago. It doesn't give us an exact date, but we know it was several thousand years ago in any case. And uh, you know, although scientists, the majority of them, don't agree with that, when we look at the evidence through biblical glasses, we find that it's consistent. Let me give you some examples of that. Uh, Jupiter gives off energy, and it gives off twice as much energy as it gets from the sun, okay? Which means it's running out of energy. It's, it's losing energy to space. Now, it can only do that for so long. And this is a little bit of a mystery for my evolutionary colleagues who believe it's been doing this for 4.5 billion years, because it should be cool. It should have cooled off by now, you see. But it's not a problem for 6,000 years. And the same is, is true of Neptune, which radiates 2.7 times as much heat as it receives from the sun. Not a problem for thousands of years. A bit of a mystery, if you believe in 4.5 billion years. You know, Earth's magnetic field is decaying. As far as we can tell, it's an exponential kind of decay, which means the magnetic field would have been much greater in the past. And uh, if we go back to the time of, of creation, the magnetic field would have been fairly strong. And it turns out you can't go back too much farther than that. If you go back beyond a, a few thousand years, the magnetic field becomes incredibly strong to the point where you know, it would start ripping iron out of your blood, and that's not good. So uh, apparently it hasn't been doing this for very long, you see. But it's not just the Earth. Did you know that the, the planets also have very strong magnetic fields? Jupiter has a whopping big magnetic field. It is enormous, very strong. Uh, it would be larger than the sun if you could see it. And of course, Magnetic fields naturally decay with time. So if it's 4.5 billion years old, it's a little difficult to explain how it could maintain this magnetic field for so long. The same is true of uh, the other planets as well. Uranus has a magnetic field that is actually cockeyed with its rotation axis. You, know, you may know that Earth's north pole is close to the magnetic pole, it's off a little bit. But with Uranus, it's way off. It's, it's tilted at a strange angle. And the same is true of Neptune. And evolutionists have tried to come up with uh, what they call dynamo theories to try and make the magnetic fields regenerate themselves. And that may work on the sun, but as far as I can tell, there's no evidence that that could, could work on, on planets or that it does. However, Dr. Russ Humphreys actually predicted the magnetic fields of Uranus and Neptune before the Voyager spacecraft flew past. And Humphreys, of course, he's a, he's a PhD nuclear physicist and a creation scientist, believes in 6,000 years, and he was able to correctly predict those magnetic fields because he believed in 6,000 years and that the, the magnetic fields had only decayed 6,000 years worth of decay and not, not uh, millions or billions. The evolutionists were way off. Not surprising, they started with an incorrect presupposition. Comets. Comets are made of ice and dirt and every time they pass near the sun, well, what, what would you expect? That ice is going to be blasted off the surface. It doesn't actually melt because there's not enough pressure to be, to be liquid. It just evaporates off into space. And that's what a comet's tail is. It's material that the comet is losing 
every time it goes by the sun. And so as you might imagine, that can only happen for so long. And then uh, the comet's going to run out of material. There's going to be nothing left. We think it could do that for maybe 100,000 years. So if the universe is 4.5 billion years old, we got a bit of a problem, don't we? But if it's thousands of years old, it's not a problem. Now, of course, evolutionists understand this, and so they say, well, maybe there's a vast reservoir supplying new comets. And of course, we don't, we don't see that, do we? We don't see an Oort cloud. Recession of the moon. The moon is actually moving farther and farther away from the Earth. It's stealing a little bit of our energy. The same thing that causes tides. Those tides pull on the moon and cause it to move further away. Now, it's a small amount, so don't worry. The moon will look about as big tomorrow night as it does tonight. It's not a, not a huge amount. But over 4.5 billion years, it would have moved an enormous distance. In fact, if you run the movie backwards, see, the moon would have been closer to the Earth, right? Um, only about a billion years ago, it would have been touching. Maybe you can make it 2 billion years, but it's supposed to be 4.5 billion years old, you see. So that's a bit of a problem, isn't it? I should add that uh, moon dust, which uh, previously had been used as a, as, a, as a young universe argument, it's not a valid argument, and it's no fault of, of the creationists. Some creationists were using evolutionist numbers, which said that if the moon had been orbiting for billions of years, there would be many, many feet of dust on the moon. However, it, it now looks like the, the influx of cosmic dust on the moon is not well known, and so we can't use that argument. It's not, it's not valid. It's nobody's, it's, it's nobody's fault. It's just it's a, an example of new evidence being discovered that overturns a previous, previous model, and that happens in science. Spiral galaxy wind-up. So the inner parts of the galaxy actually rotate faster than the outer parts, which go slower. So the inner parts are going real quick, and the outer parts are going more slowly. So um, now that's a bit of a problem because, of course, the galaxy would be constantly twisting itself up. Now it can do that for a while, but it can't do it for the age of the universe in evolutionary thinking because it would be all completely twisted up by now, you see. And so evolutionists have tried to come up with ways to maybe generate new spirals like a spiral density wave and has got problems of its own, of course. See, what, what, what I want to show you, though, is that it's consistent with thousands of years. If the, if the galaxy is thousands of years old, it hasn't had time to twist itself up. And so that's just a very simple solution, you see. Now, of course, all of these are what we might call circumstantial evidences, aren't they? I mean, none of these prove that the universe is young. The only thing that does that is the Word of God, because that's the only thing that's foolproof. That's the only thing that we're not going to discover some new evidence that's going to overturn a previous model, you see, because we have an eyewitness and an infallible one at that. But it's not just the age of things. What about uh, how the universe was created? My evolutionary colleagues would disagree with me on this as well. They would say that, well, the universe was created naturally by itself, whereas I would say it was, a, it was supernaturally created by God, and uh, according to what the Bible says. And of course, there are some problems with naturalistic formations of, of the universe and of stars and of planets. For example, the rotations of the planets, not really consistent with a naturalistic origin. In the secular model, the solar system collapses from a cloud of hydrogen gas, and so everything ought to be spinning. See, as that cloud collapses, it starts to spin, just like a skater when she pulls her arms in, she speeds up. And so you would expect the planets would be spinning all the same way, same rotation axis. They don't. Um, three of them rotate backwards. Um, some of the other ones are tilted quite a bit. And so evolutionists have said, well, maybe they were pelted by something that, that tipped them various amounts. Uh, it doesn't work for Saturn, though, which is tilted quite a lot and is too large to be, to be pelted with, uh, for, for its tilt to be uh, effective in that way. Also, the angular momentum of the sun. The sun ought to be spinning like mad if it really collapsed from an enormous cloud, because you can imagine that. I mean, a skater pulls her arms in just a little bit, and she speeds up a lot, right? Well, imagine a cloud, you know, light years across, you know, coming down to this tiny little, you know, think of it like a, a pin, the head of a pin. It would be spinning incredibly quick, and a very few stars do spin quick, but most stars don't. They're closer to the sun. The sun takes about 25 days to rotate. I think one of the most amazing evidences for supernatural creation in astronomy is that we've now discovered planets orbiting other stars. And, and although we can't see them directly, I, I am convinced that the indirect evidence is very compelling and that we have indeed found planets orbiting other, other, uh, other stars. You see, secular astronomers were expecting that other solar systems would look like ours, with small planets close to their star and very big Jupiter-sized planets far away. But in almost all of the uh, um, extrasolar planets we've found, They've been massive Jupiter-sized planets orbiting very close to the star. And this is quite a, quite a mystery uh, if you believe in millions of years of evolutionary processes. 
and they've tried to develop mechanisms that they, they can only figure that things formed far away and that they moved in somehow, you see. And then there's a problem getting it stopped and then not crashing into the star. And then there's still the question of why didn't that happen with our solar system then? So it's, it's problem after problem after problem. But if you believe what the Bible says, we can let God be creative and make solar systems however he wants to. Who said this? Atheism is so senseless. When I look at the solar system, I see the Earth at the right distance from the sun to receive the proper amounts of heat and light. This did not happen by chance. Do you know who said that? It was Isaac Newton. Did you know that the father of modern physics was a devout creationist? Had great respect for the word of God? He said, this most beautiful system of the sun, planets, and comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent being. How about that? Another thing where my evolutionary colleagues would disagree is they would say that Earth isn't particularly special. There are probably other Earths out there. But what does the Bible say? The Bible puts very special emphasis on the Earth, doesn't it? God formed it to be inhabited, it says in Isaiah. And to show its special importance, God created it first among the celestial objects. Earth is three days older than anything else in the universe. It's special. And it's uniquely designed for life. When we look at the moon, not so much. It's pretty. It's not designed for life, is it? What about Earth's neighbors? Again, pretty, not designed for life. When I look at the surface of Mars, it looks eerily Earth-like. I mean, it looks kind of like a desert on Earth, very flat. Um, but what do you not see? You don't see life. You don't see plants, you don't see animals. All you see are rocks, lots and lots of rocks. And that's about it. If we go to Venus, Venus is uh, the other extreme. It's extremely hot, 900 degrees Fahrenheit, at the surface. Of course, there's no humidity, so it's a dry heat, for whatever that's worth. <laughs> that's, uh, I think that would be a bit much for me. So this is basically, it's, it's, it's like Goldilocks and the Three Bears, right? This planet is too hot, this planet is too cold, this planet is just right, yes. But that's the first time you've heard Goldilocks applied to astrophysics. What about ETs? This is kind of a hot topic, isn't it? And of course, there's this whole program, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. But you know what, friends, they're not going to find anything. Because when I read the Bible, I learn that the Earth is special. It is designed for life. The universe is designed to be beautiful and bring God glory, and to be for signs, seasons, and days, and years, to keep time. It's a beautiful clock, if you will. But, but Earth is designed for life. And of course, if you have ETs out there that are intelligent, You've got theological problems, don't you? Because they can't be saved. They're not descended from Adam. We're all of one blood. We're related to Jesus Christ. So his blood counts for ours. This is the planet where, where God himself came and became a man, took on the human nature, and died for our sins and rose again. This is the planet right here and nowhere else. And so our, our ET friends would have, would have problems with salvation, wouldn't they? So it's, you, you see the, the theological problems here? And uh, just to remind ourselves how silly this is, you could think of, just picture in heaven, E.T. worshiping God next to you. And it kind of makes you think about how silly that idea really is, if you think about it. It's an evolutionary idea. The idea is that if life evolved on Earth, it must have evolved on countless other worlds as well. But why all the hype? Why do people really want to believe, why do people want to believe in extraterrestrials? If you think about it, you know, there is, it kind of strikes a chord, doesn't it? Wouldn't it be amazing if there was this advanced civilization that could tell us all these answers and, and maybe they could give us some meaning and purpose in our, in our lives and they would keep us company and you know, maybe they would have incredible medical technology that could cure our diseases. And maybe they even have such technology that they could, that they could help us learn to, to live forever. And if you think about that, that's really a secular replacement for God, isn't it? Because God is the supreme being who has all the answers and gives meaning and purpose to life, heals all our diseases, and has the key to eternal life. And when people reject that God, that need comes out in other ways, doesn't it?